I'm Reverend Phil, and I'm your host for Words of the Prophets. Where are our prophets now? Where are those messengers God chooses to communicate divine revelation through? In the past, the Creator has sent prophets like Abraham, Siddhartha, Jesus, Mohammed, and many more. Maybe our higher power has switched tactics since we reinterpret God's words as soon as the Creator's prophets leave us. Could it be that Spirit talks to each one of us individually and we haven't learned to listen? On Words of the Prophets, our modern prophets show us how to find the internal prophet that is the I Am, and we discuss the application of spiritual principles in all aspects of our lives. Love and light, everybody. I'm Reverend Phil, and I'm your host for Words of the Prophets. Today, my guest is Brother Don Mouton, who is a member of the De La Salle Christian Brothers here in Santa Fe. Welcome back. Thank you. Those of you who have been watching, I was going to say religiously, but that's a terrible pun. <laughs> Remember, Brother Don, we did the show on the Book of Revelation. Well, today's show is going to be on the Book of Job. And today's prophetic topic is no thought can be withholden. And this topic can be found in the book of Job, chapter 42, which is the last chapter, verse 2. And it's Job speaking to God. And the statement reads as follows. I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. And that's basically, as we're going to talk about, kind of a surrender on Job's part, but let's, before we even get into that, brother, how about you just, for those few people who have missed you the last year, tell us what a De La Salle Christian Brother is and how you came, became one. The De La Salle Christian Brothers is a Roman Catholic teaching order of men, no priests, it's non-clerical. It was started in the 1600s, late 1600s, 1680 to be exact, by a French priest called John Baptist de La Salle. That's why we're known as the de La Salle brothers. And it was mainly to provide education for young boys in special need, uh, the poor, the marginalized, the disadvantaged, at a time in France when many of the more wealthy uh, young men had educational opportunities not available to the working class and the poor. So that's how it got started and spread all over the world. And that particular group, the De La Salle Christian Brothers, is in just about every continent in the world today. And we are in educational institutions from elementary through university, special education centers. And in New Mexico, we have a school that we have been in since 1859 called St. Michael's High School, which is in Santa Fe. And we also, until uh, two or three years ago, had the College of Santa Fe on the Santa Fe campus. And that closed in uh, 09, and the campus is now occupied by the Santa Fe University of Art and Design. And so I've been involved in teaching in both of those places over the years. And the De La Salle Christian Brothers continue to be a very important uh, education arm of the Roman Catholic Church. But we also teach in schools where there are no Catholics at all. We have a school in Cairo, Egypt, where there are no Catholics. It's all Muslim. We have a school in Bangkok, for example, that they're all Hindus and Buddhists and others. So that although we are a Roman Catholic order, we are very interfaith, ecumenical in our approach. And so we like to speak of our educational tradition as a Lasallian Catholic education tradition, which is a very broad tradition. And um, that's what the De La Salle brothers are. So these schools in Egypt and Bangkok, do you teach the, the native, so to speak, theologies, or do you just go in and teach Christian theology? Well, they are staff members and faculty that are all natives and they teach of course their particular religions but there's always an option for those who are interested in studying uh, other religions like the Christian religion then a brother could teach that but it's not at all geared towards converting 
uh, students is to give them as solid an education as possible. And we're motivated by our Christian tradition, but it doesn't mean that we're out to make more Christians. Okay. <laughs> we did a show a year ago on the Book of Revelation, and I enjoyed it so much, and I assume you must have because you came back for another show. But at the end of the show, you and I were talking, and I asked you, what would you like to do next? And you, without hesitation, said the Book of Job. Why? Well, it may be that I was teaching that at the time uh, in my class, and I figured okay. it would take less time to get ready for the, <laughs> <laughs> for the show. But the Book of Job has always interested me as being a very strange radical book in the Bible. It's also considered to be one of the ancient world classics uh, and some consider it to be a masterpiece in um, literature concerning the problem of evil, the problem of the suffering of the unjust innocent people. And so it has intrigued me to see how did that book ever get into the Bible nestled among the resplendent prophets and wonderful books of the Exodus and Genesis and others. And so the book of Job, I think, is a book that at least has interested me for a number of years in terms of the challenge it poses both linguistically, artistically, and theologically. I found it kind of strange, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Do you want to start by just, let's talk about the historic aspects. Um, when, when do we place this book? How did it get in? Because you're right, I mean, it, it, it has a different tone, it has a different, right. you know, it, it's almost more New Testament than Old Testament in, in its structure and tone. Yeah, the Jewish uh, scriptures have three major classifications. The Torah, which is a, mainly the first five books of the Old Testament, or the Hebrew scriptures. Then you have the prophets, which is the major theme of your series of presentations this year. And then you have the other books called the writings. And the writings contain a number of books called wisdom literature, of which the book of Job is a member. And interestingly enough, it's not one of the prophetic books, though I would think it fits quite well into the theme of the literary literature on the prophets. So the book of Job belongs to this branch of writings called the wisdom literature, which came a little bit later in the history of Israel when um, many disasters had befallen Israel. The south had been demolished, the southern part of the kingdom, by the Assyrians in the 8th century before Christ. In the 6th century before Christ, the Babylonians took care of the south with Jerusalem as a capital. So at a time when there were no more kings, prophets and so on, the priests sort of took over. And then an effort was made to help people understand how to make sense out of life. When the normal props no longer existed, the holy city, the temple and so on. And so it belongs to this phase of literature called wisdom literature, which is normally dated between the sixth and the fifth and fourth centuries before Christ. So this is falling into the, my history is good and don't grade me if it's not. <laughs> um, this is the destruction of the first temple. It, it's after the destruction yeah. of, the te of the first temple, right, which was in, in the 6th century by the Babylonians. So people were looking to try to understand what that meant. How to make sense out of life when you don't have the normal um, theologies, the covenant, the people, the people were dispersed, the visible symbols of God's presence in the temple and the holy city are not there. What can we do to make sense out of life? And the wisdom literature has two types of, of teachings, some of the more traditional types of teachings, like the book of Proverbs, and others are more radical, like Ecclesiastes, the famous Vanity of vanities and all is vanity, and the book of Job. And these are called a radical branch of the wisdom literature. And the book of Job falls into that branch of literature which seems to go against so much of the more traditional writing in the Bible. Let's, let's get into Job then. I mean, Job is not presented as a prophet. 
Job is not presented as a rabbi. Job is not presented as any kind of royalty within you know, any community. He's just presented as your run-of-the-mill, maybe a little more successful merchant. Uh, not even merchants the right word, but he has a lot of assets, let's say, you know, they, they, they make it very clear in the beginning to talk about how many herds of this he has and how many herds of that he has. And, you know, they, they quantify everything. I mean, he's not your regular biblical hero. That is correct. Job is really a very prosperous sheik in the desert whose uh, fortune uh, got reversed and suffered tremendously. Uh, but the reason um, I, I spoke about Job with you the last time we met is I figure it does fit into the overall theme of prophetic literature because uh, although you chose a special verse in chapter 42, I too chose one to sort of be the theme that I'm interested in. And it's chapter 42, verse 7 and 8, where God tells Job, Job, your friends have not spoken rightly of me, but you have. Job has spoken rightly of God. Another translation is, Job has spoken the truth about God. And I think that's what a prophet is, one who speaks for God and about God. And that's why I think Job fits very well into the theme of your program on pro prophetic literature, that somehow Job has spoken correctly about who God is, yet, when we read the book of Job, we are shocked by what Job says about God in contrast to what his friends say. And so for God to say to Job, you have spoken rightly concerning me, after we read how Job curses God, Job is angry at God, Job is militant against God, Job calls God everything under the sun, and for God to still say, Job, you have spoken rightly concerning me, I think that's a challenge for us to see what indeed has Job said about God that allows God to say, Job, you've spoken the truth about me? Well, let's, let's back this up now so, so people can get a better understanding of the book. I mean, early on in the book, we have Satan or Satan. And it's, Satan is, is depicted as someone who is part of like a ruling council. He, he's not this outsider. He's very much an insider and it sounds like, I mean, he, he I hate to use the word, the devil's advocate, so to speak. Yeah, right. You know, he, he looks to pick apart mm -hmm. the, the demonstrations of individuals. Yeah, let me say uh, something about, about the Satan. The, the, the story begins with sort of Yahweh having a happy hour, surrounded by his angels and other celestial beings, among them one called Ha-Satan, the Satan, not to be identified with devil, because the idea of Satan being devil at the time did not exist. That's a much later development so the Satan of the book of Job is not at all the diabolical fallen angel uh, that we're familiar with. The Satan of the book of Job is simply the literary uh, translation, the literal translation is the, it could be adversary, but it's more like Yahweh's private eye, like a detective that goes around looking at different people, what's going on, and reports back to Yahweh. And that's how the story starts, where this Satan, not evil, but sort of a person exploring what's happening and reporting to God, says, look at this particular individual called Job. Uh, and, and Yahweh is so proud of Job and says he's wonderful and gives him four great compliments. He says that Job was um, blameless, upright, feared God, and turned away from evil. And Hasatan says, yes, but that's only because he's blessed with, as you mentioned earlier, so many assets. He has thousands of cattle and herds and so on, and seven mm -hmm. sons and three daughters. No wonder that indeed he is blameless and upright because he is so blessed with material things. And the Satan says to Yahweh, let me go after him. 
and let's see how faithful he remains. And it's important to understand that from the very beginning of the story because we know before the curtain rises why there's going to be a problem in the book of Job. Job doesn't know this. Job does not know that there's a happy hour going on <laughs> in heaven with a wager between Satan and Yahweh, but we do. And so that's how the book starts. And in the, you know, and we, we talked a little bit about this off air, how there are these infinite translations into the Bible. So maybe my translation read a little bit different than your translation, but it sounded like Satan suggested to God, you do these things, and God kind of threw it back on Satan and said, well, you've got the power, go do it yourself. Exactly. And you're right. And, and Satan is from the Hebrew word, which means to wander, to rove around, which is what you'd expect a private inspector to do. And, 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 and Satan says, but if you were to afflict Job, you'd see he wouldn't be faithful to you. And Yahweh says, you do it. But, first of all, you can take away his possessions, but don't harm him physically. Then you can harm him physically, but don't take away his life. So Yahweh puts a few restrictions, but he tells Satan, you do it. So there's a wager between Satan and Yahweh. We'll see later that the real wager may be something else, but that seems to be where the bet is. Is it a wager as, or is it a power struggle? It's, well, it's a power struggle for sure, but I think it's a wager, and it's, it's not so much a wager between Satan and Yahweh, though it starts that way, but that's only a foil for the real wager, which is between Yahweh and Job. As Karl Barth, one of the great Lutheran German theologians, 20th century, said it's that Yahweh bets on Job and Job bets on Yahweh. <laughs> and that is the real wager. Who's going to win the bet? <laughs> Are they right in betting on each other? And it's much more that than the Satan that disappears quickly from the scene. In Further down the line in Christianity, in, in the New Testament, we have certain references to detachment. Um, one of the ones that pop into mind is Jesus. Um, it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven, which to me is a lesson on not getting attached to the worldly goods. Are we setting that groundwork here with this story? Because, I mean, to me, I'm going to test this man's faith by taking away all of his worldly possessions. His cattle get stolen, his other animals get killed, his, you know, his children get killed. Right. I mean, his wife flips out. Uh, sounds like you know, normal TV, doesn't it? <laughs> well, his wife gave him some advice. She said, curse God and die. And die, yes. <laughs> well, that's why I said flipped out, <laughs> but, yes. But Job decided not to do that. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. It's, it's the idea of, is it possible to still have some kind of faith in God when you lose everything that you count on? And that's one of the real challenges, and we might get into that, of the theology of the book of Job. Um, and, and that brings me to something that, to, to me, is the most astounding thing, is, um, is in the very first chapter, the, the opening of the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 9, when the Satan tells the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? And it's that for nothing. Those two words are like dynamite in the book of Job. The, the idea of fearing God is to have awe, reverence, respect. That's the real meaning of fear. It doesn't mean to be afraid of. But is Job loyal to God for nothing? Or is it because he is so well endowed with riches and family and success. And so that is the real challenge of the book of Job. Is it possible to still be loyal and faithful to God for nothing? And we'll see how the book of Job develops that theme in a very dramatic way. And, and it develops it by taking it away. It's not like we start off with nothing and now you're going to be faithful. It's like well, you've had everything and now we're going to just systematically strip you of everything that you know represents prosperity and everything, will you still be grateful? Will you still be thankful? That's right. 
Um, and that, that brings up a very important aspect which is often misinterpreted, I think, in the book of Job. At the very beginning, we're told that Job is very prosperous. But first of all, we're told he was blameless, upright, fears God, turns away from evil, and he had sons and daughters and cattle and so on. And we think, and that's what the Satan said, Job is wonderful because look at all he's got. It, in other words, piety pays in the Satan's view. A yes. number of very astute commentators, more and more, are beginning to think that Job, um, that, that God was good to Job in Job's eyes, not because Job was faithful and figured out, that first of all, Job recognized God's love and God's gratuity. That came first. What came after that was his material success. And very often we try to reverse that. Because we are materially well off, we praise God. The book of Job is almost trying to say that Job was first of all convinced of who God is and his prosperity is the consequence of his love of God, not the condition. And I think that's an important message that the book of Job gives us. So what we're talking about is the application of grace. Exactly. Yes. So if we, and I used that word earlier, you know, when I, that chapter 42, verse 2, and I talk about that was, you know, Job speaking to God, and I called that the surrender. So what, was, what I hear you saying is that there is a surrender that happens, predates the beginning of the book. And it's because of that surrender that Job has all the riches that he has. I think you have just said it better than I could myself. That is exactly what I think is a major perspective of the book of Job. And he's finally, all of his possessions are taken away and he still remains faithful to God, which I think is a good illustration of the accuracy of that particular perspective that, that his prosperity is not the cause of his fidelity to God, but the consequence of his fidelity to who God is. Uh, one of the things that I uh, like to mention to people when I talk about the book of Job is, um, is the mistaken idea that has been perpetrated by Christian art called the patient Job. If you read the book of Job, there's nothing patient about him. Job is a very violent, aggressive, upset human being asking very serious ultimate questions. And this idea of the patient Job comes from, um, uh, from the New Testament where the book of James, which is the book right after the, the letter, the section on, called Book of the, to the Hebrews, where the book of James in chapter 5, verse 9, says that, um, and I'll read it for you because it's very instructive. The book of James says, chapter 5, verse 11, Indeed, we call blessed those who showed endurance. You have heard of the endurance of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And the word endurance in Greek could be also translated um, steadfast. It really means to remain under something without giving in. And uh, some translations have patient in adverse circumstances, which is the correct translation of the Greek word, huper meno, underneath, to still be patient under the weight of adversity. And that has sort of influenced our thinking about Job as the patient Job. But when you read the, what Job has to say in the book, which is most of the book, uh, there's nothing patient about him at all. Well, there's a tone of anger. Exactly tone of frustration you know I mean it, he that question why do bad things happen to good people is what he keeps asking so we're getting into the dialogue now with his friends and he you know he has some friends who come sit with him kind of they're shocked 
that's there to support him. And then they get into this dialogue. And they're saying to him, well, this wouldn't have happened out of nowhere. So you must have done something. What was it? And if it wasn't you, maybe it was your kids or, you know, it was like they're looking for somebody, right. to, something to blame, someone to blame for why this was happening. And he was saying no, but he was still defending it kind of angry. I mean. Right. And, you, and what you just mentioned is, I think, a help for reading the book of Job is to realize that it's in two major styles. One is called the prose style, and that's the prologue, the first two chapters, and the epilogue, which is the last chapter. It's in prose, an ancient folk tale that predates the book of Job by many, many years. It can be found in Babylonian literature, Egyptian literature, Sumerian literature, Mesopotamian. So it's an ancient folk tale about a prosperous person that suffers inexplicable suffering. Then there is the poetic section of the book of Job, which is chapters 3 all the way to chapter 42, which is 90% of the book, which is the dialogue between Job and his friends, his three friends that come to see him, and that's in some of the greatest poetry of the ancient world that we have in the Bible. And it's in that interchange between Job and his friends that is a true biblical message of the book of Job, where his friends try to convince him that if he's suffering, he must have sinned in some way. They are defending the principle, it's known as the Deuteronomic principle in the Bible, the principle by which God rewards the good and punishes the wicked. And that is to be found in the Torah and many other books of the Old Testament. And Job is saying, no, I am innocent. And one of the thrilling qualities of the book of Job is he never admits to guilt. He is innocent which just emphasizes the mystery of why then is he suffering? And the friends keep forever defending who God is to tell Job, you had to have sinned, or as you mentioned, or your children, somebody did, otherwise you wouldn't be suffering. And Job never gives in to that argument. And so that's one of the major contributions of the book of Job is that Job will show that his suffering cannot be linked to the idea that God rewards the good and punishes the evil. In fact, in many, many places, Job shows how the wicked prosper and the good suffer, in spite of what the friends are telling him. So when we get to the end of the book, to come back to the beginning of our conversation, when God says, Job, you've spoken the truth about me, God is in so many ways saying, I'm arbitrary. <laughs> or I'm free. And that's why one of the marvelous pieces of literature written as a sequel to the book of Job is by Robert Frost called A Mask of Reason, M-A-S-Q-U-E. It's sort of a play and it takes place a thousand years after the book of Job is finished. And Job is in an oasis. He has been restored to prosperity, the, the epilogue, after all of his sufferings. And he's with his wife. I told him to curse God and die. And he tells his wife, do you see that figure over there? She says, hmm, that looks like God. I can tell from Blake's picture. Blake drew many pictures of what God may have looked like. And she says, tell him to come over here. So Job calls God to come over to talk with him. And uh, God says, hello, Job, how are you? After all these years, I trust you're doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Job tells God, you are a twinge of rheumatism now and then, but overall, I'm fine. And it's a beautiful a beautiful little play of the conversation between Job and God. But the interesting thing is God tells Job, Job, you know, there's something I wanted to tell you. I've been wanting to tell you for a long time and to thank you for showing that I am not bound by the human laws of reward the good and punish the wicked. You have helped me to prove that I'm not restricted to that. I don't have to follow that unless I want to suffer loss of worship, says, <laughs> says the text. He says, Job, you have destroyed the Deuteronomic principle. Job, you are the emancipator of your God. You have freed me. I can now be God and not be uh, subject to 
the laws that human beings have imposed that good must be rewarded and evil must be punished. So to, he, to have called Job the emancipator of your God, I think is just fantastic. And that's a challenge, I think, to all of us. Can we let God be God in our lives? And that's, to me, one of the challenges of the book of Job. I want to back up on something you said, which I was not aware of, and that is that the same story comes from other people yeah. and other places that predate this. By a thousand years, at least. Oh. Are we talking about somebody just deciding to rewrite that story a little bit nicer and saying, yeah, this is what something we have to learn? Well, I, I, think, I think your insight is a good one, that some biblical author, whoever that may be, we don't know who the author is, some think there might be multiple authors because you have a prose section and a poetic section, you have a narrative section and a dialogue section. Others think, no, it's just one unified thing where the biblical author really wanted to get that dialogue between Job and his friends, but surrounded it with bookends, the prologue and epilogue of an ancient folk tale that he took and modified to fit better his, the biblical author's understanding, who is the God of Israel? which is not like the God of the Babylonians, or Egyptians, or others. So what they we're trying to say then, if I'm following this, placing it in the time we talked about after the, the first destruction of the temple, trying to tell the Jewish people in a, a metaphorical sense, you didn't do anything wrong just because the temple was destroyed. Well, that's a very important aspect. That would go against the prophetic mainstream yes. tradition where the prophet saying, because we have been unfaithful, then there will be destruction. You will be punished. That's the Deuteronomic principle. And we have to keep that in mind. That's an important aspect of the biblical tradition. The book of Job, as other books in the wisdom literature, want to show there's another pillar on which the faith of Israel stands and it's that maybe God is not totally circumscribed by this principle of rewarding the good and punishing the evil. That there is a certain freedom in who God is and how God acts. And that is pretty well, I think, dramatically um, presented in the famous speech of Yahweh at the end yeah. of the book of Job, where finally God comes in to speak after all the friends of Job there are three of them, main ones, and then a fourth young fellow that comes along to talk. And once they all finish speaking, God comes in to the scene and speaks to Job. And for whatever reason, Job feels okay, and Job is restored to prosperity. So the big question is, what did God say in that speech that brought peace to Job and restored him to prosperity? And very often I ask the students that have never read the book of Job, once I tell them the story, what speech would you write that would somehow show an innocent man that has suffered terribly, loss of family, loss of health, loss of friends, loss of goods? What, would, what do you think God could have told Job that brought him peace? I have never seen a student come anywhere near with the biblical three chapters of the speech of Yahweh portray. And God gives a speech in two parts. One, a panorama of, um, of creation. How dare you question me? You have no idea what it's like to be me. He said, Job, first of all, he says, Job, gird your loins, which simply means pull up your socks. Stand up. It means get ready for battle. That's what gird your loins means in the Old Testament. It means strap on the dagger. Get ready to fight. He says, Job, stand up, I want to show you something. So he shows Job uh, a panorama of creation, all kinds of things. The sea, the wind, the hail, the snow, the storms, the lightning, the dawn. And he said, Job, could you control all of this? Can human technology handle this? Where does the snow come from? Where does the frost come from? Where does the rain come from? Where does the lightning come from? Where do all these things come from? And all God says, Job, look, 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 look. And when Job is exhausted, God says, hey, Job, stand up again. I'm not finished. Then he goes to the animal world, a panorama of the creation, a, a zoo, 
11 different animals are presented to Job after all these aspects of nature. So you have nature and animals in God's speech. And he said, Job, look at all these animals. And when you look at the, at the list of animals, it's surprising. From the, from the wild horse in the desert to the hippopotamus to the eagle to the rock badger to the ostrich and so on. All these strange animals. He said, Job, look at them. And what's interesting about all these animals is none of them can be domesticated. None of them are of any use whatsoever to human beings. So Job, and I think that's what ultimately the message of the book of Job is, is that Job, human beings aren't the measure of all things. You can't control the good running of the universe. There's no way you could have the refrigeration necessary to provide the snow and the sleet and the hail. There's no way you could control the thunder and the lightning. There's no way you can control the winds, control the seas that stay within their bounds. Job, there's no way you can domesticate these animals. They have no use whatsoever. In fact, one of them that's mentioned, the wild horse, is out in the steppes where there are no human beings at all. And then those that are mentioned cannot be domesticated. And he ends up with these two monstrosities, one called Leviathan and one called Behemoth, crocodile and hippopotamus and so on. And God is so proud of them. And, and in fact, many of the attributes he attributes to these huge animals, prehistoric animals, are attributes he attributes to himself. It's very interesting. And so you say, what is in that speech that brought peace to Job? Interesting question. And for me, I mean, the speech was really ego-based. There was no empathy in the speech. By ego-based, you mean? Who's ego? How dare you question me? I'm oh, God. God's ego, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah I mean. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, so, again, I, I, I want to try to t bring this back into the historic perspective. You know, yeah, the temple was destroyed. How dare you question it? What's your faith based on? You know, I'm arbitrary. You don't like it. What else you got? You know, I mean, to me, it, it, these characters were each, I mean, there's what? There's four friends. There's Job. There's God, the wife, basically. You know, so you got seven characters, and each one of them were just like so monochromatic. I, I, yeah. I, I, I had a hard time connecting to, empathizing with any of them. Mm -hmm. Well, th what Job tries to do is to show that the wife was wrong in saying curse God and die. The friends were wrong in what they were saying, trying to defend God with the principle that he always rewards the good and punishes the evil. So Job is trying to show there's an alternative understanding of who God is. And at the very end, to me, an important, and not the only one, but an important aspect is God is saying, Job, just as human technology in no way can account for the way I run the universe, things are in order, pretty stable, in no way can human utility account for these strange animals that I've created. And three of them actually laugh the ostrich and the wild horse and another one, and they actually laugh, showing this great glee and joy in these things that seem to make no sense to us as human beings. He said, just as the animals make no sense to us in terms of the utility for human beings, our technology makes no sense in controlling the universe, so the Deuteronomic principle does not fully account for God's actions toward us, either rewards or punishment. So at one of the contributions to me of the book of Job is it shows that we cannot blame automatically suffering on sin or suffering on having done something evil. We've got to look somewhere else. And as I think in my own life, and I like to tell my students, it's one thing to know the answer. And that's part of wisdom. But part of wisdom is also not to build our lives on wrong answers. 
And it's better not to have an answer than to have the wrong answer. And we're told the wrong answer is to believe that if you're suffering, it's because somehow God has punished you. That's very liberating. So we're just here to accept. Yes. And in fact, that is the ending of the book of Job. In the speech that Yahweh gives, he never once mentions anything about Job, never once talks about his sufferings, never once apologizes for all the tragedies that befell Job. So Job does not get an answer, but Job is accepted by God, a personal speaking presence. And I think that's a challenge of the book of Job. Is faith possible in suffering? And the message of the book of Job is, Faith is possible in suffering. Job never wavered in his faith, never contemplated suicide, never cursed God. Faith is possible in suffering because God is above all of that and not to be questioned. So again, <clears throat> coming back to the destruction of the temple, just believe. This happened for purpose and reason. You don't need to know. Just keep the faith. I, that would be one way of looking at it. Another way is, why was the temple destroyed? And maybe it was in the broad scheme of things, God saying, I want my people, my chosen people, the Jewish people of whom Job was a member, I want them to go out to the whole world to let people know who I am, a good creator, where everything is good, and we have to be good to God, good to one another. And we have to be localized with a centralized place that would monopolize God's presence on this earth. It might have been part of a larger plan, go out into the whole world and be my witness, which is what God wanted after the Exodus. Go be to the world a witness to who I am. Decentralize. Exactly. Yet they came back and built another temple. Interesting. Which also was destroyed. Yes. Later in 70 AD, the yeah. second temple. Let's go back to the friends for a second. There's four of them. And they're each, in my perspective, have weird names and come from unidentified places. But these real places. I mean, we've got, what is it, Elipaz, uh, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuite, and Zophar, the Namathite. Were these real places? I mean, well, these neighborhoods? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the, these are ge geographical names which are a bit exotic. I think uh, they did exist. Uh, but, but that's not that important. It's just to show that they came from outside. They were not Jews. They were from the pagan world, came in to speak to Job about his God that seems to be behaving in such a strange way. Um, so they represent the non-Jewish world that's in dialogue with Job. And Job just refuses to give in to their battering about who they thought God should be. Then the fourth one's in there. I forget, Elihu yeah. is his name. The Buzzite. Uh, right. So um, the friends are there as, as a real, it's like a tag match in wrestling where the main wrestler meets one guy, then he jumps out of the ring, a second guy comes in, he jumps out of the ring, another guy comes in, and there are three cycles of these dialogues each, each of the friends of Job represent a slightly different perspective on who God is. And um, Job has to spend his time refuting what they're saying. They're defending God. And Job is opposing God. Well, they're defending God by putting the blame on something they cannot specify that Job or someone in his family did. Uh, Elihu is... I think, coming to the end, but he gets reprimanded in the end as well. I mean, he's basically saying, you know, God is absolute rightness. 
whatever is happening is happening is, is supposed to happen is right and stop questioning it. Right. He comes in towards the end. Yeah. And he said, you know, I'm younger than the rest of you, so out of respect for your seniority, I haven't said anything. Let me get in and clear it. Clear he does nothing to advance the discussion. He just summarizes more or less what was saying. In fact, he's sort of ignored when God speaks to Job. So he doesn't bring anything really new. What's interesting, though, is at the end we ask ourselves, what does Job... Un Job says, now I understand. Job, doesn't say, Job does not say, now I understand. We say, but what... Ha what has brought Job serenity and peace? And Job says, not I understand you, but I see you. So it was a personal encounter that God came to Job and spoke to him. That the book of Job is telling us, even in the midst of suffering, inexplicable suffering, God is still present. The presence of God in the suffering. It doesn't make human sense, but that's the contribution of the book of Job, is that we can't judge everything just by what it means in our human scale of values. That Job says, I have seen you. I may not understand everything, but I know you're there, even in what seems to be your absence, according to more traditional perspectives. So, having seen God, where, I mean, God again is presented as introduced as the character, so to speak, is this, this, this powerful wind. You know, God does not come down in a form or human form. It comes down as a wind and talks yeah. through the... Yeah. Job wanted him to come in a court of law. He wanted to come in a court of law with an arbiter, an umpire. God shows up in a whirlwind. Not at all what Job expected or Job wanted, but that's how God came. And that might be another aspect of the book of Job is God comes to us in ways we don't yeah. really know. And God comes, and at no point, I mean, after the beginning, we don't hear of Satan anymore. Out. Yeah, so I mean, God doesn't say, well, I gave this guy a little bit too much power and he went nuts. God's owning the whole thing. Is that trying to send another message? Well, that's back to something we mentioned earlier, that ultimately the real wager, and which is to me the major contribution of the book of Job, is not whether Satan can beat God by harming Job. The real wager is, does God dare take a chance on Job and allow the Satan to do that? And does Job take a chance by not cursing God and staying faithful to the end? They bet on each other and they won. Satan would not be vanquished by God beating Satan. Satan is vanquished by Job beating Satan. And that's another message of the book of, of Job, is we must overcome evil. That is our challenge. How can we do it? In our own lives, our personal lives, in society, in the evil we face in this world. Um, but, I mean, Satan does not, I mean, he's the adversary, he's the, the prosecutor. I mean, it comes in two stages. He loses his possessions and he starts to lose his physical health. Is that what we're considering evil? Yes. Yeah, well, that's evil. He lost his possessions. He lost his family. He lost his health. I don't know what else you could call it, but that is suffering. That's evil and to an innocent person. And that's the unanswered question to this day. I mean, we just have to know with the news that's going on right now, how so many innocent people are suffering, whether it's Newtown or the Boston Marathon or Aurora, Colorado, or the people that have just suffered the disasters in West Texas. Why do innocents suffer? It's the same question that had to be faced. And is it possible to still have a faith in God 
when this occurs. And, and the book of Job is telling us, see, the, the, God's answer is not totally satisfactory. Look at creation, look at the animals, and Job says, and it's an interesting phrase, I, dis, I repent in dust and ashes. This little text has been translated in so many different ways. Some feel he means, I repent because I'm just dust and ashes. What it really means is, I repent trying to understand things merely as a moral human being. There must be something other than what I can grasp, just as dust and ashes that I am, that makes sense. And so what makes sense is Job said, I was right in still having faith when I was brought to the brink of disaster. I, we're starting to run down on time. I want to make a couple of announcements, and then let's finish up with Job's reward for his faith. Because I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a lesson in that one as well. I just want to thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoy what you're hearing. This is Public Access TV, and this is only here because of you, the public. Love to hear from you. Love to know, you know, things that you might want to have the show cover, topics you'd like to have a look at that. Maybe you'd like to do a show with me. There's something that you think there's that you could add to the dialogue on spirit that we could do together. Love to hear from you. The contact information has been flashing on the screen. You know, reach out. Um, I also just to let you know I am a, besides being a minister, I'm a state licensed counselor. I do spiritual counseling. I believe that kind of the theme of this, this, this show, faith is the ultimate answer. Our faith, our spirit are what heals us, what keeps us strong. And that is the way I do counseling. And my counseling is transdenominational. I'm not here to convert anybody. I help you find what works for you. I'm not a congregational minister. So, you know, it's not about you have to be Christian. You could be Islam. You could be Buddhist. I could, anything. I, I work with anybody and everybody. Whoever the bind puts at my door is welcome in. Um, and I do my counseling is on a donation basis. So if money is an issue, don't worry about it. And, uh, you know, give me a call. We could set something up. So let's, let's get back to this. Anyway, I should have asked, do you have any announcements you'd like to make? So I'm very happy that you have this program, and I congratulate you on bringing this type of um, information and discussion to the public. I think it's important that we keep we keep the conversation going. That's one of the, I think, contributions of the book of Job is, is, is the ambiguity of the entire God's speech, which is, at the end, he's just bragging about this big monstrosity called the behemoth. And that's how it ends. And it, it stops there before the ancient prose section takes over to say Job was restored that was one of the questions you asked. His health was brought back. To prosperity. Everything is doubled. He has twice as many camel, twice as many sheep. What's not doubled is a number of kids. Yes. And somebody said, that might be one of the great blessings also that Job, Job received. But his daughters received very exotic, humorous names. And, and, and they received the land, which is, goes against social conventions of the time. It should be the sons that get it, not the daughters. And so right away we're being told, maybe our human way of judging things is not what should totally dominate us, that we have to be open to the possibility of other things. So the ambiguity of the book of Job and the conversation of Yahweh is the conversation must continue. We've got to keep talking. And ultimately, I would hope that we can all say what Job said. I heard about you, but now my eyes see you. And if we can say that in adversity, in difficulty, my eyes can still see the presence of God. I think the book of Job has brought us some invaluable contribution to our faith. And that's the message. 
hold the faith no matter what. And I mean, I, I the one thing besides that, they, he talks about at the end. Uh, Job is given 140 more years of life. You know, his life is extended out. You know, and it's again. I keep coming back to the temple. You know, just we've got to believe. We've got to have faith. We've got to redo. You know, rebuild our faith. And it's not about the external structures. It's the internal structures. I, I think that's a, a good conclusion to our conversation. Is that ultimately. God's presence will not be limited to a physical place called the temple. It's in each one of us as we are in this world. How can we be places of God's presence for each other and for the whole world? That's the challenge. And that brings us right back to that whole, you, know, you talked about the prophets and how Job should really be you know, considered a prophet. My favorite line of all the prophets, and I can't quote it you know, verbatim out of the text, but basically it was, it was early on in Isaiah, and God is talking through Isaiah, basically saying, you know, your, your ceremonies offend me, your incense smells, you know, get out of here and go help somebody. <laughs> I don't need this stuff. You know, and that seems to carry this, you know, again, we're not here to have those structures. We're not here to attach to the external symbols. We're here to have faith. And then we can take that faith out and do something with right. it. Have a parting thought? We've got about a minute and a half left or so. Well, the parting thought that I have is that um, the dialogue about our faith should remain open. The book of Job does not give satisfying answers, but it tells us to keep our hearts and minds open to dialogue with each other, to try to make sense and help each other see how indeed in all of these things, each of us can say, now I see you. Brother Don, thank you so much. Thank you. I want to thank you for tuning in. I'll leave you with this thought. Serenity is not freedom from the, so not freedom from the storm. It's peace while in it. Blessings to you all. I'm Reverend Phil, and I've been your host for Words of the Prophets. Thank you for tuning in. Please join me again next week, same time, same channel, for more Words of the Prophets.